We're here with Mike Farrell, <coughs> Mimi Silver, and so we've got a tremendous opportunity uh, along with uh, two of my students, Krista and Ivana, to talk about leadership with you both today. I guess let's begin with, uh, with both, of you, both of you, and uh, or maybe firstly with uh, you, Mimi. Uh, yeah, how do you describe yourself? I threw out that word leadership. Do you think of yourself in terms of a leader in society uh, or an activist? Or how, how do you describe what you do? Actually, what we'd love to be thought of is a role model. I don't think I've ever really used the word leader, uh, but to try to be an example of what is possible is one of the ways that I look at my organization. I think of myself simply as part of my organization. Mm. Um, you know, it's one of the things you said at the beginning. It's interesting because we have a set way of solving social problems in America. I started out uh, going to graduate school and then teaching in criminology and working as a prison psychologist uh, and I was going to therefore solve you know poverty and turn around the lives of criminals and drug addicts and it became very apparent to me quickly that these ways won't work. It doesn't matter how great a therapist you are. These are not issues that are happening within a human being. They're happening interactively between that person and his or her society. And I looked around and there really wasn't anything. And so I just decided, well, here are the things I believe should be happening. And so we'll just bring some people together and do them. Um, sometimes there isn't an opening in, in the paths that are set. And Delancey Street has always been an odd organization. We're in our 31st year, and there's still no definition of the organ. We call ourselves Harvard of the underclass. <laughs> yeah, I've read that. <laughs> Harvard of the underclass. We <laughs> aren't anything. We're not a drug program, even though our people are all drug addicts, and they stop being drug addicts. But yeah. there are things that define them. And we're not a literacy program, but everyone gets educated. And we're not, you know, we, we are an odd organization. And we found in the 31 years that many, many thousands of people who are unable to live a legitimate and successful life using and interacting with traditional institutions have been able to learn everything and graduate and become very different. And so in some ways, we're really the opposite of a leader. We're off on some alternate path, yeah. chugging up a mountain, insisting um, this can be done, this can be done. And we've attracted a lot of attention given the fact that we're just a little group of nobodies funded not by the government, which makes it really difficult to get noticed. Right. Uh, we're just there. So in that sense, we've attracted a lot of attention, but in another sense, we're not leaders because the country so far hasn't followed <laughs> <laughs> by solving the social problems in the way that we think we've exemplified is possible. Well, um, let, me, let me ask you this then. What's, what's your, do you have like a mission, the sense of yes. purpose of what oh. you're out to do? in the world, like you, not just uh, the Delancey Street, but you personally, in regards that incorporates and includes the work of Delancey Street? Well, I'm lucky because when you create and then run your own organization and it's not funded, mm -hmm. then all my missions I can try to do. Right. <laughs> uh, there's nobody to tell me 
oh no, that's not the way uh, what we'd like you to do is. So, I mean, for me personally, I started to say this. I grew up here in Boston. I started out in Dorchester. And then, Dorchester. <laughs> and then, when I was 12, I moved to Brookline. Two very different worlds. Uh, I, my family was an immigrant family, and I lived in a small flat with grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins, and the idea was we would make our way into the American mainstream, and you know, the children would have the, the dream, the dream, the dream, and we eventually moved to Brookline, and you know, I kind of overachieved because of that. I got two master's degrees, two doctorate degrees, and went to, when I got pregnant, I had twin children. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the idea was make it, and everybody in Brookline, the issue really was, are you going to Harvard, Yale, or MIT, whereas people I knew from Dorchester who were wonderful souls, many of them ended up um, in prison and dead. And so in some way, my mission remains to go back to Dorchester and get everybody out um, that I knew that should have made it. And of course, everybody in some sense, therefore, to me, are my friends that by a flip of the coin yeah. um, are not part of the America that my family came here to believe in. Um, the underclass in America, as I've lived with them now for 30 years, because that's who comes to Delancey Street almost exclusively, are not part of the America that all these other people I know are talking about and being part of. And that's awful. It's really awful in a country that's only 200 something years old. So your that's commitment, my mission. Your mission, your commitment is to work with that underclass? Absolutely. And yeah. to insist and demand and, you know, push <laughs> um, their way in and get all the access to all the opportunities that are supposed to happen yeah. for everyone, and then to teach them to make legitimate and successful use of those opportunities. Can I ask a question? You said that like, you want to be called the role model, which sounds great, and you want probably other people to follow you, and you said that so far actually you haven't got the state actually doing more or less anything. And do you see yourself in the role of like attracting bigger, so general public trying to follow you because this, what you have accomplished obviously, works as a great model. So you got all these people on the right side. So that coin really, so you succeed in flipping it. But would you try to do the same with the larger yes. public? Yes. That how? For the next, thir at our 30th anniversary, you know, from years 25 to 30, from years, I don't know, 10 to 25, I felt it was important to know within myself that we had really looked at every possible door to refine our own way of doing things so that it was the best that I know how to do. I'm not saying it's the best, but it's the best I know how to do. It's another interesting thing. When you're funded, I know a lot of programs. They're all, and pretty much they're funded. That's the way nonprofit programs think they have to work. When that happens and you write grants, you define yourself as successful all the time because you have to, because you're busy yeah. telling your funder how successful you are because they demand it in order to refund you. But when you're not answering to those silly people who don't really know what you're doing, then you have a, you know, you have a higher order of being to answer to. You have to answer to yourself. Uh, 
And so I spent a long time refining so that I felt, I don't know what successful is not a good word, but you know, this is as good as I know how to teach people to be the best they can be and make society better. You know, our, our graduates are all doers. They're, they're not out there just getting their car and their children and their job. They're all doing something once they go. Doing something like, aren't they oh, making a they contribution? Oh, they work with, absolutely. They yeah. work with kids and they, they work with lots of other social problems. That's um, a significant part of learning how to live life. You know, it's one of the wonderful things when you deal with people from the underclass, and these are, I have a group of residents here, if anyone wants to hear from them. But you're 40 years old, you've lived most of your life on the streets and in prison, and you have no idea what a, quote, normal person does. And so they don't know that normal people are not all helping other people and doing things decently, and so I get to teach this is the way people do it. And by the time they've graduated, they've learned all those values, and then they come back and say, this is not the way other people are doing <laughs> things. Um, and then, you know, I say, oh, well, this is the way they should be doing it, so it's too late. Um, but at our 30th anniversary, I made a firm commitment to respond to what are now um, about 10,000 letters a year from all over the world. I look at him because, of course, Australia is one of the places of the, you now define Australia. You are Australia in my mind. <laughs> yeah. um, from all over the world of mostly folks. Sometimes it's government. There are some, you know, Florida, there are some odd either cities or states. We just came from the little state of Delaware in which the entire legislature and the governor has been coming to Delancey Street and asking us, would you please open here? But usually it's just people who have been trying various things and come from the oddest assortment uh, of backgrounds and say, would you please come do this here? And I don't know what the best way is. I'm trying a lot of different ways um, for the next 30 years to see if we can not muck Delancey Street, which I don't want to do, and at the same time make the model more of the way people think about solving problems, social problems, certainly. Um, okay. <clears throat> you are talking about in America, and for that matter, we could say Australia or, or anywhere in the world, there's kind of a set methodologies of problem solving. And you said that those uh, kind of accepted and, and, and shared methods that uh, are prevalent either through uh, politics or, or, or state or local government or what, whatever it might be, don't necessarily work or achieve the best outcomes. Uh, and with Delancey Street and the other activities you're involved in and also Mike's involved in, on one hand I guess you are problem solvers or at least raising the awareness that we do have a problem here whether or not you actually solve it is another thing. Uh, oh no, I'm solving the problem. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Damn it. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, spend yeah, every yeah. minute trying desperately, I mean truthfully, desperately to, to solve, solve these problems. Okay, so, so it's not kind of enough for me to just chat about them or very good bring attention to them I want to well those them. two areas if you could I got your, your, your passion <laughs> of what you're out to do I guess I want to look at both sides of that one how do you generate awareness that this is a problem in our society and two how do you marshal the resources beyond your own energy of which there's a ton of to actually solve them it's very interesting, and Mike said the same thing, and of course we, we 
come at it from very different places. Um, I'm not notorious except within my own small <laughs> world. Uh, but I have found actually one of the things I like the best about life because it's something I choose to believe. You know, as you grow older, a lot of the things you believed as a child fall away. Um, I choose a certain amount of positive naivete about how I live life. And the more I live with people whose lives have been horrible, um, the more desperately I choose that approach. And one of the things that I believed as a kid is that if you do good things, good results will happen. And of course, that, that myth has been debunked repeatedly. But I choose to believe it. And one of the fascinating things about our little organization is we have no PR, uh, we, we do no public relations, we do none of the things that someone would teach you will attract people's attention to what you're doing. And I firmly believe if you insist on doing it and doing it well, if you actually are accomplishing what you're doing, someone will notice. And in our case, that's really been true. Uh, in the cities in which we live, we have the most wonderful community support, none of which we have actively <coughs> gone out and sought. Uh, we do things that interact with society regularly because, of course, we're teaching people how to interact effectively with their society. One of the very funny things, if you just pause with no political overtones, uh, you take people who, by definition, are not good at interacting with their society, and they mess it up, and then you, and they've committed some crimes, and you take them out of that society and put them far away from it for a long time and then bring them back eventually to that society and then you're even angrier with them because now they know less about interacting with it. Well, duh. Uh, <laughs> even if all the best things happen in prison, which they do not, it's like locking a bad child in his room with a television set all the other children he got in trouble with and then leaving them there for 10 years and being surprised 10 years later that they're good at being in their rooms with the television and one another and they're bad at everything else. Uh, but one of our goals is to teach people to be successful interacting with every element of society and so we earn our money through things that train people in marketable skills, but also when you run a restaurant and you run a moving company, you're in lots of people's homes and they come to your home and you begin to interact with a large portion of, of your community. And just from the universities that are there that call regularly and they bring their classes to Delancey Street and they invite our residents to talk to their classes. All the way through uh, just individual people yeah. who knock on the door and say, I love this, how can I help? It turns out that if you try to do the right thing and you do it well, and maybe have a little excess flair. Uh, <laughs> that helps, doesn't it? <laughs> um, maybe if you locate yourself in the best neighborhood and yeah. it draws attention to the subject. But I mean, the subject actually is 
why can't people who are working hard live in the best neighborhood? Well, yeah. Why is it that just because we're all living together and we're a group of X, a lot of X things, X felons and X drug addicts and X gang members and X, why can't we live in the best neighborhoods in San Francisco um, and elsewhere? In fact, if you look closely, the people who are living there are the grandchildren and great grandchildren of the robber barons who, you know, made the robber their barons. money. Yeah. Uh, okay. The Carnegies yeah. and the, you know mm -hmm. all the great names. Uh -huh. How did they make their money? Uh, those questions aren't asked. So sometimes you draw attention by doing something. It's a little bit in the face of some of mm -hmm. the things that Mike was saying uh, people take for granted as you know, only millionaires so you, you, there. Go ahead. Can I follow up on that? What Mimi said about uh, the myth of doing good creates good. Yeah. Um, that's something we all learn. What the, the word is left out is people assume it's automatic that if you just do good, then everything's going to be fine. And then people get frustrated and say, well, Jesus, it's not fine. I did good, and it's not fine, so I'm going home. Yeah. Uh, in fact, doing good is, is a good thing, and it's fulfilling. And if you keep doing it, even if it's invisible, it does create good. It creates a positive reaction out there. But we have a, we have a, a social order that argues against that because it's dangerous yeah. to many people. You know, some of the things that are being said here are revolutionary, and that's uh, socially revolutionary, and that's uncomfortable for a lot of people. Yeah, so how do you measure your success, or is even that the, the right way to talk about the work that both of you do? Uh, is there a measure of success, or is the measure of Only success... Only if you're um, from the John F. Kennedy Jeez, School of Government. government. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't even do think you in those ways, measure right? Success. It's not about measurement, it's not about success, it's about one soul at a time. Absolutely. Yeah. Alex, to me, it's about one person at a time, but it is also about process. One of the things that really aggravates me, because it turns out as a byproduct, we have great statistics. I hate them. <laughs> and I hate the fact that there are people who come and visit what we do, and then they, I talk about the process, and then they say, OK, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that you've been so successful. You're absolutely wrong. It's just not what matters. What matters is the process by which we're living our lives every day. Um, and that, to me, is really the definition. It's the definition I hold, and it's the one when I, we were talking about those first 30 years, it's, it was the process that mattered the most and still does. Uh, and all, all of this measuring of success that everyone is going around doing, you know, a life, a human life, and certainly a life in, in terms of the social studies of it, has followed academically and therefore by all the people who measure it, the medical model. Yeah. Uh, you know, the drug problem is, is located somewhere here in your arm between, I guess, where you're shooting it and your nose. Uh, and then people talk about cures. Uh, no, everything nowadays is becoming a disease, something that frightens me. Social problems have been criminalized and now they're being medicalized and people talk about them as if they reside within a human being and somehow you can measure a cure. And that's not how we live our lives. We live our lives day to day and luckily we can recreate ourselves day to day and sometimes we all sink to the worst of ourselves. Everybody! And sometimes we can really work hard and pull to be the best of ourselves. 
And that's what we're all doing here, yeah. is trying to keep pulling to the best of ourselves all the time and um, and then hoping because you don't ever become the best of yourself alone yeah. and so by definition you're climbing a mountain and you're holding hands uh, and sometimes we're sliding this way and sometimes you can use your energy to pull to climb up the mountain and the more you're doing that and the more you're pushing to be your best self and trying to impact <coughs> other people then I guess the more you're living the life that will have to move civilization forward if yeah. we keep doing it and ultimately then people looking back will be able to measure a certain amount of success or failure, but this absurd notion that we are studying a laboratory of the human beings in it and measuring ah, success, ah, failure, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, we are not, it, it just doesn't work that way. So it's very it's really it's almost, frustrating. It's countercultural in a way, <laughs> what, you, what you're saying. I mean, because the donors, the funders, the politicians, everyone who hangs around, or reporters who show up, well, what are you doing? Sure. Give me another way to say that. Uh, a fellow I was deeply fortunate enough to become associated with years ago said that uh, if you take 10 people who have, you know, by social definition failed, and you extend yourself to them, and you reach out, and you, you teach, and you work, and you, you really try to reach those people, he said, Statistically, four out of those ten will succeed. So by the statistical model, you would then pick out the four and the types of the four, and you would pull back, and you only get, you, you take uh, ten of those types. And when you did that, four of them would succeed. <laughs> so you're effectively working backward. He said what you have to do is expand it. You have to reach out to everybody. You can't define yourself or your success by this kind of statistical analysis. Yeah. And you know, it's so absurd. You, I, every person you touch, touches other people. I'm always saying to people, you know, so what if we only cured one person and it was Martin Luther King, <laughs> damn it. You know, each person then goes out and affects an entire world and, and it, life, and all the ripples that we create are just not measured by this foolish, narrow definition. Uh, is this person now committing crimes? I mean, I'm a criminologist. I have a doctorate in criminology. I feel entitled to criticize the things I do, and therefore that entitles me to extend my criticism yeah. <laughs> outward. So in my field, I started in criminology in the 60s. From the 60s to today, the definition of recidivism, which means the return to doing the bad things you were doing, it's redefined every six months in every city you go to. So initially, recidivism meant, did this person ever return to committing a crime. Well, and then it became, did this person return in a year's period to committing a crime? And then it became, did this person return in a year's period in this area to committing the same type of crime that this person committed? And then it became, in six months, in the same county. And when you read that data, you have no idea whether this particular Department of Corrections is defining the word by category of crime, by crime itself within three months, within a county, within the state, within the universe. Uh, and then they compare these recidivism rates of our recidivism rates versus, I don't know, the Department of Corrections in uh, in Cambridge 
And each one is defined differently, and people are very busy studying that, and in fact, no one really knows. Uh, someone, Carl Menninger did a study on Delancey Street, and he came out with some 98% success rate. Uh, and I laughed, and I said to him, I love you. But Carl Menninger is just one of the most wonderful, aside from starting Menninger's clinic, sure. as a human being, he was just wonderful. And I said to him, but if we analyzed your life, Carl, you do not have a 98% <laughs> success rate in your own life day to day. We trip, we yeah. fall. Yeah. The issue is how we pick ourselves up. Do we pick ourselves up? Yeah. And what do we then do? And how many people do we <coughs> impact? Yeah. How do you measure that? We don't yet. Um, so how, how do, you, do you maintain the motivation to, to do that, since it's like you don't know really how well you're ever doing beyond the initial feedback. Oh, you know every day how well you're doing. There is no human being that goes to bed at night between the person and the judge that lives within us that does not know how well he or she is doing at their dreams, at their goals, at their values, uh, I think we know. Does it ever seem frustrating? I mean, it seems like you're both. The work you're doing is working against social Tied. currents, working, yeah. And how, how do you keep yourselves going in the face of that? I mean, are there times when it seems hopeless? And if, whether or not there are, how do, you, how do you keep yourself going? How do you keep yourself motivated and committed as you clearly both are? For me, it's hopeless every 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that? I mean, I continuously and quite frankly, sometimes fling myself on my bed sobbing repeatedly. Uh, I mean, you know. I'm, I, I, I live in a glass house, you know, I live in Delancey Street. We all know everything everyone else is doing. Um, and I do f feel the way the residents feel. Mm -hmm. I feel it from time to time, which is, oh my God, I can't, I just can't, I can't do this one more minute. Um, everything is pulling backwards and it's not just society you know I feel like we're fighting society and then I'm also fighting the residents because they have a very strong self-destructive pull I mean repeat offenders and things like substance abusers and they are compulsions and they therefore have a compulsive, self-destructive pull that goes the other direction. And it does feel like you're in between a rock and a hard place. Um, and so sometimes I'm really petty and self-indulgent, and I feel terribly sorry for myself as well. And I feel like I just can't do it. Um, but you keep on doing it. But then the joy is another human being yeah. is in your face. And underneath the glare and the growl um, is a desperation and an earnestness of somebody that I don't know who else or how else they're going to fight for an opportunity. And so you just say, here we go. Yes, we are going to do this. Um, and then you charge forward. And I don't know that it's really much different from raising a child. Yeah. It, Kind of unconditional. It you just is. You you really don't have a choice. Yeah. You know, the child mm -hmm. is crying and screaming, and there are times where you want to say, 
okay, where is that tape, that roll of tape, right? <laughs> Just tape this mouth up because it's frustrating and I don't know what the kid wants and there's too much noise and I don't want a lot of noise right now. And um, in the end, you don't really have a lot of choices. In terms of <laughs> strategy, maybe another dirty <laughs> word here. What about you, Mimi? Do you think in terms of... Of, of strategy or strategic <coughs> interventions into the society for the maximum um, results? You know, it, it's an odd word for me. I, I, as a I sensed it would be. As a, <laughs> as a life strategy, I guess, I choose to approach fights uh, by being nice. First, I like niceness and goodness, um, and I like to see them win. And you know, I remember when we were building, we were, we were the first people to build a new neighborhood in San Francisco. We built a huge 400,000 square foot complex, and it turns out that as we were building, we were doing it ourselves. Uh, a number of developers came on either side to build towers, market rate towers, and they came and told us we had to get the unanimous approval of all of the developers around us. And I went at first and I danced and sang and talked about you know, all our statistics. We've yeah. never had an arrest and our people are so good and crime goes down in the areas we are, and property values go up and and I kept doing this and this one neighbor uh, just kept saying no and in the end, I, I remember this vividly because it's a time in which my approach to life didn't work uh, and I came with a cutout article from the newspaper that talked about middle class drug use. Mm -hmm. And I, I came and I said, I am going to everyone from the governor on down to forbid you to come into this neighborhood. It says here, 35% of your people are going to be throwing white cocaine powder wow. on my sidewalks <laughs> where I will have no cocaine, and et cetera. And I Jeez. said, that's it. I am protesting you. I've had it with you and your yuppie people that you're bringing into the neighborhood and we got a unanimous approval. <laughs> I was unhappy because technically, you know, my strategy yeah. of getting it for the right reason didn't work. Uh, I, I like to try to, I have this belief that if I could sit down and talk with every human being in America, I could get them to vote differently on the <laughs> issues that are of deep concern to me, on criminal justice issues. I mean, I truly believe that. Um, and so I pick, for example, when asked to speak, I will only go out and do two speaking engagements a year. I pick those really strategically. I try to pick what I call enemy territory. Right. Try to pick people who really think differently. Can you give me an example? Um, oh yes, I when the when the three strikes law was being passed in California, I accepted uh, a talk with our governor at the time, Pete Wilson, uh, to a victims groups. The audience was all, though it was composed of activists in the victim of crime movement. Harriet and, Salerno. Exactly. <laughs> Harriet Salerno. And, and there were like 3,000 Harriet mm -hmm. Salernos <laughs> in the audience. And uh, I talked with them without labels, you know. I said, okay, we're going to talk about an offender. The point is everyone wants crime to stop. It's not as if the rest of you know, people use that phrase, tough on crime, you know. Who does not want crime to stop? It's not like I want to say, 
Here, I'd like to walk the streets and be mugged and abused, beaten. Uh, the issue is what will best stop it. And of course, since crimes are committed by human beings, what will stop crime the most is to stop these people from committing the crimes. And since, unless we want to buy every continent, like if, if America took and of many kinds and types. And so the issue is we have to teach people to do it differently because yeah, they and to are think in differently society. As well, right? You're trying to get them to change To their act differently because that's what matters right. in the end. Yeah. It, it, you want the, action. A crime is an action. I differ from the Catholic Church in the sense <laughs> <laughs> that I think you can have bad thoughts, yeah. but not act on them. Right. And it is not the same thing. They are not both an equal sin. Uh, it's yeah. very different to sit around thinking <laughs> and then to do good actions. Eventually, if you act nicely and well, I believe it impacts how you think. So it actually goes backwards. So you're trying you to move to people into first. action and get them engaged with these issues and doing things and then... And in my talk, in the end, actually the governor turned my microphone off. <laughs> because <laughs> it's written up in the newspapers. <laughs> because when I said to people, okay, so we have a choice. We can either take this person who has just committed this crime, yeah. and you can take 50,000 of your tax dollars and put them in a, in a room mm -hmm. with all their friends, require nothing of them, <coughs> uh, and we will do for them, give them their meals, do everything for them, but we will hate them. Mm, yeah. <laughs> or we could re take none of your tax dollars and require of them that they go to school, <coughs> that they learn skills, that they do a number of things which are really quite harsher, only we will like them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Liking them does not make us soft on them. On the contrary, when you love someone, you demand more of them. You demand them to be responsible and accountable. You hold them to a higher standard. Yeah. Uh, that's what liking them means. The people we like, we aren't soft on. Yeah. We're soft on the people we hate. We throw them away. Yeah. Um, you know, which would you choose? And of course, they all chose. I said, <laughs> so erase whether you like them or hate them. Which action would you choose for them? And they all chose teaching them, making them go to school, making them be accountable. You know, they did it out of annoyance. Uh, I said, that's the only thing I'm going to erase, is what you have to feel. You can feel angry, but you will. And then they all raise their hand to send them essentially to an alternative mm -hmm. wow. to prison. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think what you're talking about, what we're talking about here, is getting people to move beyond, beyond being defined by their fears. Yeah. Mm. You know, so much of what our society's been about has been limiting and closing off right. and stopping and stemming and keeping from, all of which is fear imposed. And maybe is this word that's you know, unacceptable today in many circles because it's embarrassing, but it's love, yeah. the option is to either fear or to love. Yeah. And Mimi and Mike, what do you do, like, you know, that example you gave is really great, so you put yourself on the line, you went out there and you succeed because you got so 3,000 people thinking differently. But what would you do if the turnout is actually not that good, so you put yourself on the line and unfortunately some message you try to send across is not accepted. How do you actually deal with yourself? How you just bring yourself back? and to get them, just keep going, actually, that's a question for both of you. 
In other words, is it ever okay. wanted to add to it? Too? I would like to edit out right. my initial answer. <laughs> and so, because the truth is, if they don't respond correctly, I become immediately like a child and I get with whomever I am and I say, Do you believe those assholes? <laughs> 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 so I become them. You know, I throw a bad label on them and I dismiss them instantly, uh, which is exactly what they do to us. Um, but you're aware that the you The difference do that is too. I'm aware and then I stop it. And yeah. then I come back a different way and say, Okay, uh, going in between the cups didn't work. Let's see, what if, what if we go this way? And, you know, the thing is, the wonderful thing is, no one succeeds. If you think that anything you're going to do is going to just work well all the time, uh, it just doesn't. It never has, it never will. And so what you do is you make a lot of mistakes and you're perfectly comfortable saying, I screwed that up, I did that wrong. Um, okay, so now what? Okay, I went on the left side, now I'll try the right side, now I'll try going forward, now I'll sing, now I'll jump, now I'll dance, now I'll cry, now I'll yell, now I'll beg. Um, no, there are some choices. Like, Mike is, is elegant and has stature. There are some choices that are defined by who we are. I am never elegant. So some choices <laughs> are simply taken from us, you know. On the other hand, I'm little. And so I can jump up and down a lot and not be threatening. Uh, Gerald, you know, we have in Delancey Street people who are six, seven, and they're huge and uh, black and scarred, and they cannot jump up and down in a crowd and point their fingers. It will be taken differently. You know, so in some sense we're defined the ways we can try, but within a certain context you fail, you, you try something else. Do you, it's just, uh, I spoke, or I asked you earlier about that, you know, measure of, of success, and, uh, and so you don't think in terms of success, but do you think in terms of failure? That, gosh, I failed to get them on board, I failed to uh, to mobilize uh, that particular community for you as well, Mike. Is, is there ever a sense that I'm not getting through? This oh, is sure. uphill all the sure. way. Sure. Should I even be doing this? No, that uh, you know, the issue, I think, what Mina was just saying is the issue is not what impels you. I mean, there, you either believe or you don't. I'm, what works for me and what has worked for any number of people with whom I've been associated seems to me to be the proper way. So if I can find a way then to articulate it, to demonstrate something, to set an example, to do however I can do it in a manner that reaches out and opens something in that other person, fabulous, then there's, then there's success. And if it doesn't, then you just have to find another way to reach out and, yeah. and, 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 and try and open it. It's not, it's not about being, uh, going home and sulking and, well, maybe I'll go home and sulk for a little while. But, <laughs> but it's not about um, saying, oh my God, I was wrong. I have to go back to uh, reevaluate my premises. It's about, okay, well, that didn't work. How do I, what do I have to do now to get beyond the fear that is really what's separating us? Um, and um, keep trying. You see, when you go against the tide, what you're calling failure, we accept as a given. Yeah. Mm. Failure is a given. It comes with the territory. It comes with the territory. That's already yeah. what you expect. Yeah. Now what you're trying to do is undo that expectation yes. and find an opening. Yeah. 
and then you get excited with every opening. Yeah. You assume a closed door. Right. Yeah, very good. Yeah. I, we've got some of your uh, other guests here, and I appreciated you jumping <coughs> in before. Has anyone uh, got anything uh, to add uh, about uh, Michael Mimi in regards to your experience in working with them or, or doing the work that you do? Oh, yeah, well, I've been in Delancey Street a long time, and uh, I first came to Delancey Street. I've been in prison all my life, basically, adult life, and on the streets most of six months from the time I was 21 until the time I was 31. So I didn't really know how to do anything. And you know, a lot of the things that they say about having an opportunity, having a chance, I had some, but the ones that I had, I didn't use. And I didn't know how to do anything with the opportunities I had, because I never learned anything. So coming into Delancey Street, it was like going into a whole new world. I had no idea what responsibility meant. I had being nice didn't even exist in my world. So I had to learn all those things along with getting an education, along with how to tie a tie, along with just the basic things that, you know, I guess a lot of people learn from the time they're like 12, I had to do at a really old age. So it was kind of like being a kid and growing up again. But it is really, you know, it's, it's good because now I get a chance to teach people how to tie a tie and how to be decent and how to be nice. And What's the inspiration? What was the inspiration for you? How come you stuck with it and just didn't give it away? Prison was the ins <laughs> inspiration, <laughs> to be honest with you. It's not like I came to Delancey Street because I wanted to change and do anything different. I was facing a prison sentence of 20 years, so I had a choice between going to Delancey Street for two years and going to prison for 20 years. So. Um, but something happened at Delancey Street where you said... Yeah, for, the first thing I, I kind of learned was that I needed to change because I didn't think at first I needed to change. I thought everybody mm -hmm. else was a problem. Then I learned after a while because Delancey Street puts you in a position where you do like little step, little things. You're on maintenance and you sweep them out and clean and you wake up and you go to work every morning and you get that kind of like under your belt. So I figured out that I could change and that I needed to change. And it took a long time, it's a really long process. Because it just What's the difference between how you feel about yourself now and how you felt about yourself then? Well, I was really nasty and really mean and really negative, and now I'm you know, actually nice. And <laughs> 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 but, I mean, I feel like I have a future. I feel like I can do things differently. I feel like there are things in life that I can accomplish that don't necessarily revolve around me. I can help people and I can do things that, you know, advance people besides myself. I don't have to look after it. Because the only thing I did before I came to Lansing Street was look after my own best interest. And so if I could put a word on what you just said, it's hope. Yeah, that's a good word. Absolutely. I learned that hope. Because I was pretty hopeless. You know, Gerald said something that I think is really important because I didn't know it. I didn't understand it from school. I only understood it from thousands of Geralds. I used to think somebody had to have hope in order to change. And I've learned that it's often backwards. Mm -hmm. If you live in despair, you don't really know what hope is, and so you don't have hope. You have to succeed first, and because you succeed, you begin to say, oh, then I can be there. And that's what hope is. It only comes after you've had some success. Yeah. Um, and so again, action versus inner. Yeah. Uh, the actions come first. The success, they are little successes, but they're successes. And then you begin to hope for more. Yeah. Uh, because it be becomes possible. Right. I didn't know that. And I don't know that people who have hope or see possibilities in life 
I don't know that we know that about the people who see no possibilities. Mm, yeah. That's when I was saying, you know, you try and reach out and you try and turn a key. If there's an experience with Gerald or somebody else, that's, and maybe it's, oh, shit, what is that I'm feeling? You know, what is that? And then there's somebody around to say, well, that's hope. That's what, <laughs> that's what gives you the opportunity to think that maybe there's something out there that is even better. We're going to have to wrap up in just a few minutes. So I want to ask you uh, both this. Uh, here at the Kennedy School of Government, <laughs> we, we teach uh, a variety of things. Uh, one of the things that uh, we claim to teach uh, is leadership. Well, we have a lot of aspiring leaders, people who want to be leaders, who want to be in these positions of authority and responsibility in the world, and whether to what degree they will make a difference is, you know, we shall see. Given what we've been talking about here, certainly I can extract a, a number of just uh, beautiful and insightful lessons, but what would you both say that aspiring leaders, or at least people aspiring to contribute in the realm of the public arena in a variety of ways, from elected positions or appointed or in nonprofit organizations or as activists, what do we as teachers really need to be focusing on and what is it the students really need to be learning to truly make a difference. Sure the strategy, the planning, all that stuff they're going to get some some uh, way or another. That's a given. But what about the fire in the, the fire. belly? That's <laughs> the whole issue. You see you can learn all of the things around it but if a person only has those things, then they're a paper leader, they're, they're air. Uh, you have to have a fire in your belly about a belief, an issue, a system, values and actions um, and you cannot let your head however learned it might be as it steps back to look at what you're doing ever get bigger than the fire in your belly and one of the difficulties about teaching something about which I have never thought public leadership as I'm looking. One of, my, one of the fears that I have is that someone might lose their fire and think that they needed to have better strategies in their heads. You can redo your strategy every minute. You can re-strategize. The fact that you got accepted to the school of government means you have the ability to re-strategize. But if you ever lose the fire in your belly, you have to go somewhere, find a human being that has no hope and they will inspire you and you'll get your fire back. Never lose it. That to me is the, the most critical thing. Uh, talking with leaders of all different kinds of things. I either feel them or I don't. And if I don't, I find myself drifting away. I have to force myself to listen to their strategies. Yeah. <laughs> um, can we teach? That's not something no, that naturally can be taught. That's not taught. But how do you ignite it? It can or be develop? not. It can be the important thing because people come to the school because they have one. You see, that's why they're coming to this school instead of getting an MBA. Yeah. And so they have already self-selected by some vision. There is inside of them 
the germ of a vision. And the hope is that teaching things that can be isolated, talked about, and taught does not take them from being in the moment and doing, mm -hmm. and, and does not make them feel that they're silly or naive. You know, there are some people who have gone through Delancey Street and gone on to get a PhD in clinical psych, which is my field, and they, they become very self-conscious. And then they say to me, oh, I don't talk in any of the jargon that they talk in. And, you know, I, I, all these people are so professional and I'm not. <coughs> I, I was there. I had to unlearn all those things to come back to reach you. Uh, don't ever let your education spoil your intuition. And so th I would say, you, I'm sure you're teaching all of the best of the things that can be taught. The only thing that worries me is to say to your students, something in you chose this school. It was a vision, it was a belief, it was a dream, it was something that wanted to make the world better. Be naive. Take that and hold on to it. Don't get in, so intelligent and sophisticated in your thought process that it interferes with the simplicity of the goodness of that vision. That will out in the end. That will, that will win. It, it's what matters. Don't lose it. Yeah. Um, I think we're probably saying the same thing. I think I would suggest that you um, tell everyone who comes here with the stated intention of becoming a leader to distrust all of the reasons they claim to want to be a leader. <laughs> he does that pretty well, well yeah. That's probably start with our leadership class. Um, I, to analogize, uh, there are many psychiatrists and psychologists who went into psychiatry and psychology because they know they have deep-seated problems and didn't want to face them and figured if they got the information they could deal with them themselves rather than admitting to somebody that they had these problems. So the, the, what Mimi's talking about is that that motivating impulse that says, I care about people. If you don't care about people, don't be a leader. If you don't care about people, there is no place for you in leadership. We have far too many people in leadership today who don't give a damn about anything but self-advancement. Uh, but that place where you, uh, that says, I care, is what has to be nurtured. And that's, you can learn all the strategies here, but that's what has to be developed. And, and the way you develop it, it seems to me, is get down in the struggle. Get down with the folks you claim to want to lead and get to know what moves them, what prevents them from doing the things that need to be done and figure out ways to, uh, to uh, inspire them and allow them to inspire you. And that, that's what leadership is. And, uh, but as you look to the future, uh, just as a, a final uh, comment, are you both optimistic in regards to the work that you're attending to, or is there a sense of doom and gloom, of pessimism? Uh, since it comes with the territory that you are going against the tide, is you look around, do you see more and more people with this sense of moral outrage, with the fire in the belly, so that there is a sense that it's not just me out there, or a small group of us out there, but there's a significant movement. A lot of people are getting on board, and we are shifting and changing society. In dramatic Those way. are two s totally separate questions as I hear them. One is, do I, do I actually think that there are more and more people uh, getting morally outraged about injustice? I do not. But I see them anyway. <laughs> so. <laughs> So am I optimistic? Absolutely, 100% optimistic. Uh, 
I truly believe that, you know, the moment is upon us, but I don't see the moment in front of my eyes. I do see, unfortunately, the underclass sinking lower. I see us isolating problems more and more, and now we're, now we're medicalizing everything. Yeah. I don't sit well, for example. I have a lot of energy. I always thought that was a great quality, but now I find out I have attention deficit disorder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we're just labeling. We can, we can fix that. <laughs> exactly. We're labeling and curing all, all kinds of diseased people who are being more and more left out now with this kind of benevolence. Poor things, they're not just assholes. They really are <laughs> sick. Um, that really frightens me because it means more and more doctors or of some kind are going to be needed to cure them. In fact, um, I see within every problem the germ of its own solution. Yeah. Um, so the people who are the problems are the solution. Yeah. And that's what I'm so optimistic about, yeah. is that as the world gets smaller, you know, and Mike himself is traveling all over the world, so he alone is dropping little germs of possibility all over. As people see, not you can help me. I can. I can anything. Doesn't matter what comes at the end of the sentence. Once more and more people in the world begin to see, I can so that all of them are some little version of leaders. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That to me is the hope, yeah. and I'm very optimistic about it. Um, so the fire in your belly is not waning or diminishing in any way. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a bundle of fire. You're, you're, you're <laughs> exactly, because in fact, I, I really, the more I get into seeing things, the worse they look yeah. to me, and so I am then supercharged. Yeah. What about you, Mike? Uh, we'll finish up on that note, too. Oh, I'm, I'm obviously, well, I don't know if it's obvious, but I'm very much an optimist. I, you know, it's the Johnny Appleseed theory. It's, uh, mm -hmm. You not only go down and you plant little seeds of hope, but every place a seed of hope is planted, that springs up people who will go plant seeds of hope. I think we have a struggle. I think we have a huge struggle, and it'll be a frustrating one. But it, it's really, in my view, the struggle between those who want to live in fear and yeah. those who choose to live in love. And and I think the you know as as embarrassing it is to use those words sometimes, and as sort of outré as it is, uh, I think that's really what it's about. Uh, and I absolutely believe that love will triumph. I'm I'm, I'm a cockeyed optimist in that <laughs> sense, uh, and I think that. Uh, the idea that, <clears throat> frankly, um, I never went to college, so uh, college for me has always been a kind of other world, and Harvard is sort of the peak of the other world. <laughs> uh, to be able to sit here uh, with a Harvard professor and students at Harvard and talk about these things is very exciting to me. It's the idea that those that the halls of academia are not closed to these notions that. Uh, People do respond here just the same as they respond in uh, the trenches somewhere. Yeah. Um, gives me hope. Yeah. Well, this has been a. We red can cure you! Yes. If you will only <laughs> let us, we could cure Harvard! Why <laughs> 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 cure us? <laughs> well, this has been a rare and uh, extraordinary conversation. So uh, I want to thank you both so much for this. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. It was really great. It was yeah. just a pleasure to be part of this. <laughs> I couldn't say it better. <laughs> do you, do either of you know what you want to do? You do.
You don't. And they do. One does, one does, one does. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> what do you... I want to do like something similar you've been doing, but probably just a little bit like with a broader perspective, like combination of international development and through international development, sort of conflict management, so leadership, all this. Right. It's difficult to define it, but that's an idea. That, that you see, yeah. if you could define yeah. it, <laughs> it means someone's done it. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that you can't define it means you're going to create it, which yeah. is what what needs to happen. The things that we've done, obviously, have not really taken us to the kind of unity we need. So especially in, quote, economic development and people getting along with each other and having a life. So you sh yeah, you shouldn't be able to define it. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's cool. So, so, so three guesses. It. Three guesses where you'll end up. <laughs> um, three things that pull me most strongly right now are working with trauma survivors, um, intractable conflicts, and just trying to help resolve those. And I see those two issues as being really linked. I mean, one is an intractable conflict within the person, and the other is more within a larger group or society. And um, And the other is more uh, maybe means to an end. Um, writing, political cartooning, ways mm. to get a message out. Oh, and that's great. I'm not sure how that's all going to tie together yet, or if it will. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so glad you said cartooning, because the, we forgot one thing that I think is really important that I don't know if you teach. It's the opposite of intractable conflict. Humor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so necessary and it just seems to be fading and one of the things about leaders is they do take themselves so seriously. <laughs> and in order to succeed and really to resolve conflict inside yourself and with other people and get through a day of facing what's awful, you just need a lot of humor. Mm -hmm. um, and so that cartooning thing, that was an important <laughs> thing to say, because even if you don't do it through cartooning and you write, find something funny <laughs> about what, what we're all doing, because it, it's so serious. You mm -hmm. really need an edge of some humor. A lot of balloons out there that need to be popped. <laughs> And maybe there's some hope at Harvard after all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we were just being fresh. Yeah, oh, okay. I was being fresh. He's not fresh. He's nice. <laughs> very good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do you, good, you? Do you ever um, come out to San Francisco? Now and then. I, I, I want to come out. Please visit us. Oh, absolutely. Oh.